Welcome uh, to those of you that have logged on this evening um, to our Doctors for Change webinar at Forum on Social Media and Combating Myths. We are very excited to have the uh, faculty from the Jack Valenti School of Communication at the University of Houston here with us tonight to talk about things that they're seeing in the world of social media and um, to discuss ways that we might be able to, as people who work in public health and healthcare, combat uh, myths and misinformation. We know we've been seeing a lot of that, especially as it relates to COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccines. And this is just another tool in our arsenal as we learn how to communicate better um, with the general public, with patients, and then in our own lives, um, at, you know, in the use of social media. For those that are not familiar or might be new to Doctors for Change, we are a membership organization dedicated to improving the health and well-being of all uh, Texans. We're based in Houston, and we're very excited that you could be with us tonight. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Jen Vardaman, who's going to introduce our illustrious panel of speakers this evening. For those that have questions, we're going to ask that you go ahead and use the Q&A icon in the bottom of your screen and type in the questions. All of the panelists will be able to see the questions. And then as we finish out the presentations, we will unmute the microphones and let people ask anything that they might have um, pending after that. So thank you again to our wonderful guests this evening, and we look forward to an awesome presentation. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Ariana. And can y'all hear me? Can anyone give me a thumbs up? Okay, great. Um, I'm Jen Vardaman, and I'm an associate professor in the Valenti School of Communication, and I'm also the interim director. And I'm excited to present to you all tonight because I've been following Doctors for Change for several years now. I know kind of what y'all are up to. It's very cool. And um, I'm just really excited that we can share our expertise in any way that it might be able to help you all. I'm going to present uh, later on. Um, the, the real heavy hitting researchers are, are going first before me. I just have a few little like applied tidbits that I think are interesting at the end. Um, but I'm gonna, what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna introduce each faculty member um, ahead of their presentation. And we do see that um, there's a Q&A box in here so you can add questions. If the questions um, don't seem to be like flooding in and there's just a few at a time, we might go ahead and just answer them after each presentation. But I am gonna kind of cut questions off if it seems like we're not able to keep time because there are about four separate presentations tonight. But we do welcome any questions. This is what we do um, for a living. We're always taking questions from students and uh, community partners alike. And so please um, do feel free to ask us anything and everything. And um, I feel really honored to be able to talk or to, to, to bring uh, this group in particular uh, together today because these are some of um, our best scholars at Valenti and they are doing amazing research and I couldn't be more proud of everybody on this panel today. Um, University of Houston did something really important in uh, almost about a year ago, which is they, uh, the division of research designated half a million dollars to internal grants for researchers who wanted to conduct studies around either COVID or racism, because at the same time we were, uh, you know, that was around like June 1 and, and when our Black, Life, Black Lives Matter movement really took off. Um, but several of the faculty that are being, or that are presenting today received some of these grants and they're conducting the research now. And so we're really getting tonight some very cutting edge research about how to combat um, misinformation, particularly about vaccine hesitancy on social media. So um, with that in mind, I'm going to introduce the first uh, two panelists. They are working together on uh, a research study right now. They earned a grant from this uh, funding mechanism that I was just telling you about. The first, uh, the first Professor is Dr. Wen Lin Liu, and she is an assistant professor of strategic and organizational communication at Valenti School. Her research areas include interorganizational alliance, immigrant and multi ethnic community building, and social network analysis. 
Dr. Liu was a leading member of the Alhambra project, which takes a theory-driven approach to investigate the role of community-based storytelling and local nonprofit organizations in building a multi-ethnic community located in suburban Los Angeles. She has authored nine journal articles and book chapters covering topics including multi-ethnic community engagement, corporate nonprofit partnerships, and organizational alliance building using new technologies such as hyperlinks and social media. She's received several top paper awards at conferences organized by the uh, International Communication Association, National Communication Association, and World Association of Public Opinion Research. Prior to her appointment with us, Dr. Liu taught at the University of Houston downtown. She also worked as a media analyst at the Consumer Media Division at Thomson Reuters in Beijing. She is going to present along with our colleague, Dr. Yan Huang, and she is an assistant professor of integrated strategic communication at Valenti School. She holds a PhD in mass communication with a minor in statistics from the Penn State University. Her research sits at the intersection of strategic communication, persuasion, and media psychology, and it investigates how content features and technology aspects of media messages shape audience responses to health, nonprofit, and pro-social campaigns. Her work has appeared in top journals in our field, such as American Behavioral Scientists, Health Communication, and Journal of Communication. And again, and you're, this won't be the last time you hear this tonight, her research has been recognized with top paper awards from the International Communication Association, the Association for Education and Journalism and Mass Comm, and International PR Research Conference. Prior to her appointment, she taught at Southern Methodist University. So uh, with that, Drs. Liu and Huang, take it away. Okay, uh, so good evening, everyone. Uh, it is a great honor for us to present uh, some of our research on misinformation. And um, so, uh, like our amazing colleagues are actually going to present different subtopics to start. So I thought I'm going to focus uh, my presentation mostly on the concept of misinformation and also some of the research findings that we've had regarding what we've known about misinformation and also its dissemination mechanisms. So I think misinformation is really becoming a very um, uh, like hot topics over the pretty much over the past decade, uh, more so in the political election context, but recently um, in medical, in public health, and also crisis communication context. So while a lot of us talk about misinformation, computer scientists, political scientists, communicate, communication researcher, um, I think one of the one of the issues or concepts that really come to our mind is what is actually what misinformation is. Uh, and there are also some a few other related concepts. We kind of like um, hear about them circulating around, like rumors, fake news, or urban legends. So all of these. So I thought it's really helpful for us to start with some of the concept about misinformation. So um, generally speaking, uh, misinformation can be simply defined as false or misleading information. But there's actually some fine line between the type of information that is spread intentionally versus the other type that is more like you know uh, information that people seems like unintentionally spread it. Um, or the nature of the information is not verified. So the typology that I included here presented one of the pretty widely used typology that pretty much categorized different types of false information based on the intentionality. So misinformation is really the one that we do not quite know the intentions of spreading it. Um, so, um, but something in common across these types of information is really the false misleading nature of these. Um, and also some researchers actually argue it might not be as helpful uh, for us to kind of like dis differentiate misinformation, disinformation or malinformation, because sometimes the intent is actually hard to really see from a Facebook post or a tweet. Um, so, oops, sorry. <laughs> so um, what have, uh, I mean, as I mentioned over the past five, 10 years, there's actually an emergent body of research looking at uh, information, the spreading of misinformation, the producers, 
consumers of inf misinformation. So what have we? Um, so what we know about misinformation is something very interesting about the demographics or the types of individual that researcher actually found out. They're either more likely to consume misinformation or they're actually more likely to spread information. So here I'm just listing a few um, demographic char characteristics or also other um, um, indicators that have been found. Seems like individuals who are more likely to be engaged in sharing information tends to be associated with the age, their gender, educational level, and also their political affiliation, li media literacy, and their levels of media trust. So I'm going to go over each one of this briefly one by one. So when it comes to age, um, actually recent research showing um, older individuals, they tend, to, they tend to be this primary group who shares misinformation. For one thing, they are the active consumers of misinformation, which might naturally lead to their sharing um, of misinformation. So one of the recent studies actually shows for the age group of above 75, that is a group that are seven times more likely to share misinformation than the younger, um, like uh, younger, gener uh, younger groups between like lower, younger than 30. Uh, another study that looks at the COVID-19 related information sharing found actually females individuals um, older than 50 years old, they're also seems like more likely to share misinformation. So gender and age, this is something that research seems to, researcher seems to identify uh, a group um, that they're more likely, it seems like they're more susceptible to misinformation. Um, I think this might also tell us um, um, in terms of doing intervention, it might actually be better to target certain demographic groups like older individuals and females individuals. Um, educational level, so for this, and surprisingly, uh, individuals with relatively lower level of education level, they're more likely to share misinformation. And when it comes to people's political affiliation, so the extreme, those who are on the extreme ends of their political ideological spectrum, and especially conservative individuals, they're also found to share individuals significantly more likely than their liberal counterparts. Um, so it all seems like all these different demographic factors are actually essentially associated with individuals' media literacy, and especially their digital media literacy. So media literacy really refers to um, the ability of an individual to tell, to critically evaluate media content. So not surprisingly, individuals who are low on media literacy, they tend to be more susceptible to false information and also more likely to engage in the spreading behavior. And then finally, research has shown that it also has a lot to do uh, media trust. Since a lot of the misinformation are actually circulated in um, like less credible media sources. So individuals who do not have a very high level of confidence um, towards the mainstream media, they're more likely to turn to this alternative or less credible media. So um, this is also something probably not surprising that when it comes to individuals' media trust, those who are low on media trust tends to, they're more likely to spread misinformation. So on the graph that I included here, this is one of the um, re one of the findings from the Pew Research Center. So they found when it comes to sharing a particular piece of information that COVID-19 was planned, um, actually they show this is the finding speaks to the educational level. So less educated Americans are actually more inclined to believe the conspiracy theory that COVID-19 was planned. They believe that is true. Um, so I think this line of research is still going on, but um, I think there's actually something pretty consistent and interesting finding when it comes to some other um, like previous topics like people's political knowledge, their health literacy. So I think a lot of these factors are actually they are um, confirmed in the context of inf misinformation sharing or spreading. Um, so like the past five, 10 years research in different disciplines, I think there are actually a lot of mixed findings, but at the same time, we do seem to come to a few pretty established, um, like more established knowledge about misinformation uh, and its spreading uh, uh, mechanisms. So the first one, the first point off here is, uh, it's actually compared to true information. 
This is also something pretty worrisome um, and also makes debunking misinformation important is when it comes to the rate of diffusion, um, actually false information or misinformation, they tends to diffuse faster, further and sometimes deeper in a social, social circle than true information. So that really means that when we're talking about the same piece of information, uh, I mean a similar content, um, the false information by having certain components or, you know, because due to the nature, the novel, the novel nature of false information, they actually have better, um, they are better able to diffuse further, uh, further to a larger circle, rich or larger um, groups compared to true information. I think this is really something uh, very similar to the idea of like the bad stories, they tend to travel further and faster than the good news. Um, the other um, finding regarding the spread of misinformation is actually emotion really plays a very significant role in promoting individuals' exposure to misinformation, their engagement with it, like they retweet a particular piece of misinformation and actually uh, associate with their acceptance of a particular piece of information. So again, this may not sound very surprising. Um, so research does find out when it comes to comparing true stories, um, verified content versus false information. Um, when they analyze the type of replies, comments about these two different types of stories that they found, well, true stories, it tends to um, really promote more um, kind of like uh, sadness, joy, and trust, whereas false stories, they're more likely to, to inspire fear, disgust, and surprise. And all these emotions, um, there actually has been found in psychology studies that those are the type of emotion really promote people to, um, to react and, um, um, and then to engage in this sharing behavior. So this is the second finding regarding emotion. And then the third finding is actually about the virality of misinformation. So one issue that make information really um, like a very concerning topic for public health practitioners um, or for public opinion uh, um, researcher is because actually some of this information, they're really good at spreading fast um, and becomes viral within a short time period. But instead of really different than the common beliefs that um, virality or the spread of information happens person to person. Um, actually, researchers find out it's more effective for misinformation um, or actually information in general to have this more like star-like structure when it comes to the spreading. So in other words, the way misinformation spreads or gain virality was when this piece of information is able to reach a particular opinion leader or influencer of a particular community and then multiple individual or multiple followers of this uh, influencers is able to further re they receive the same piece of information also because of the fact that they really trust this star figure this opinion leader figure it's more likely to actually for them to wholeheartedly accept the message and then further spread it to these individuals network so i thought this mechanism is also very helpful when it comes to um, devising effective plans to debunking misinformation to kind of um, um, identify being able to identify the influencer of a particular mis piece of mis misinformation in helping uh, uh, like control or manage the spread of that particular information so there are also two mechanisms that have been found um, that really drive the spread of information and uh, misinformation um, I mean aside from um, the, the three findings that I just talked about. The first is actually this very interesting um, phenomenon called the bots. So we are probably f familiar with bots like those automatic chat, bo chat box or even Google. They have those robots. Um, like they would automatically responding to individuals, to customers or users inquiries. But the bots that I'm talking about here, these are actually different types of bots. They're oftentimes called a social media box. So there's actually a recent study that found out like 15%, um, like eight to 15% of Twitter users, they're actually social media bots. So those bots, those are actually more like manipulated or compromised accounts. 
they tend to tweet about a particular uh, message or interacted with real individuals um, under the disguise of a real person's profile. So um, actually bots were found very influential in the spreading of misinformation. So the figure that was presented here was one of the research that University of Indiana, uh, researcher at University of Indiana, um, they looked at um, all the tweets surrounding a recent vaccination law using a particular hashtag. And then they are able to use computer algorithm to identify the bots, which are not real individual users in the spreading, uh, in the spreading process of a particular piece of misinformation. So in this particular graph, you see the red dots, they're more, they're identified as bots-like accounts. So as you can see in this spreading retweet network, um, actually bots plays a very significant role in terms of, um, like tweeting the same misinformation repeatedly, um, also being able to spread this particular information to a larger community. So there are actually two strategies that have been found, has been used effectively by these bots. The first one is, so when it comes to spreading uh, misinformation, the social media bots, they were actually able to um, like repeat the same piece of information at the early stage of its spread. So actually for a piece of misinformation to become, to spread organically, bots actually plays a more significant role at the early stage. Um, and also I think bots are pretty smart in terms of they knew um, like how to leverage the role of opinion leaders. So something I just mentioned about the uh, virality of misinformation. So bots, by following uh, opinion leaders, engaging with opinion leaders through retweets and mentions, this it has also been found as an effective strategy for bots to be able to really promote the spread of misinformation. Um, so the other mechanism that has been pretty um, um, like established when it comes to uh, wit, like how this helps to spread of misinformation is this idea of echo chambers. Um, so this is the idea that um, um, actually I think a lot of us we could probably relate to. When it comes to individuals' information diets, when it comes to who it wants to follow, which type of media outlets we want to um, get our daily information, we all have this natural tendency to follow the type of media sources that seems to reinforce where it is consistent with our own worldview. So um, echo chamber is really something not nothing new. It uh, it is always like uh, seems to be reinforced by this internet um, or people's they have greater um, ability to select which type of information sources they wants to um, they wants to select. So when it comes to misinformation, this actually becomes a perfect mechanism that seems to help the spread of of misinformation. So one of the studies that analyze um, like the Facebook posts surrounding um, a conspiracy theory and then the other is a community that seems to follow scientific findings. Um, they actually identify a pattern that looks something just like the graph presented here. So these two communities, they seem to be tightly, tightly connected with their own community members who stick to the same idea. They either advocate, promote um, conspiracy theory, where the other group, they're more vocal about scientific, scientific, scientific finding. So when it comes to the social media interaction, these two group members, they're quite separated from, from each other. So to the extent that one group, if there's particular information, so when it comes to um, the kind of like, um, consuming information and then making the decision of spreading it. Not surprisingly, this type of type of spreading happens within their own group. And then also the fact that if you, uh, an individual is pretty much like they trust the sources, that uh, they take their daily information diet, they might also become less critical when it comes to debunk or um, um, try to correct a piece of misinformation. So overall, echo chamber, this is also kind of like this particular um, phenomenon that has been identified as a very effective mechanism when it comes to the spread of information.
So, um, so, so far I've um, briefly talked about like some of the existing findings about what misinformation is and some of the mechanisms of how information spreads. But I think based on this, there are actually uh, could come up with a lot of intervention or ideas about correcting information. For example, I think a lot of technology companies or uh, nonprofit organizations, something they are working on is actually to, um, to kind of like, for one thing, how to improve individual citizens or public's digital media literacy so they are better able to discern uh, false information and not really engage in the spreading behavior. Um, and also, there are also computer mechanisms that are developed when it comes to more effectively detecting social media bots. Um, and also being better able to actually um, um, engage in fact checking. So uh, I think there's actually a lot of ongoing research and, and practitioners. I'm actually now going to hand over this to Dr. Huang. So she's going to talk more about some of the strategies that have been found effective in spreading um, this, um, in preventing the spread of misinformation. All right, thank you, Dr. Liu, and good evening. I'm still waiting for the options to share my screen. Okay. All right, can I verify real quick who will be sharing their screen? Yan, Dr. Yan Huang. See that? All right, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. All right, good evening, everyone. Sorry, sorry you cannot see me because for some reason the webinar application and my cam, for some reason, they don't like each other. Um, so just following Dr. Liu's wonderful introdu uh, introduction about misinformation and how misinformation spread, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what I have known about misinformation correction based on my recent research. So I'm gonna focus on, in particular, how to use media messages and placement to correct misinformation. Really depending on the time when the misinformation is corrected, researchers have categorized two types of misinformation correction. And the first type is called free banking. So another name for that is inoculation. So basically it's just like how vaccine works. It's when the professionals have been aware of the existence and distribution of certain misinformation. So they uh, decided to preactive, proactively inoculate and warn people about the coming of the misinformation. So for example, hey, you're going to read a message later or somewhere or pro probably from someone telling you that uh, COVID-19 vaccines may cause, I don't know, uh, infertility or something like that. And when you warn people of that and try to um, prepare them for a persuasive attack from misinformation, that's called pre-banking. And another strategy of correct misinformation is just debunking that. So when people are exposed to misinformation and you correct the misinformation right on the spot or afterwards and try to correct any influence on people's cognitions, memories, and beliefs. There are several meta-analysis that have been done by things that said that all the empirical evidence on the effectiveness of misinformation correction. And overall, despite all the challenges to correct misinformation, so for example, as Dr. Gulu mentioned, um, people sometimes may have confirmation bias. And when they hold a certain misbeliefs, they decided to just hold on to that and without changing their attitude. So it's not, it's not easy to change that even though meta-analysis showed that no matter if it's debunking and pre-banking, they can generate effects on changing people's attitude and behaviors towards the desired direction. It's just there might be some difference in the effectiveness. Overall, research shows that debunking is much more effective than pre-banking because when you warn people of certain messages, they may not be motivated to process the message. But when you debunk a misinformation, it's right on the spot, it's more targeted in a way. Another good news for health professionals is the same meta-analysis actually show that it is less difficult to correct misinformation in the context of uh, health. 
then if it, the information is about politics or it's uh, coming from marketing claims. But another, on the other side, um, sadly, we see that nowadays a lot of COVID-19 related misinformation, vaccine related misinformation are somewhat mingled with the political beliefs. So when that's the case, it may be a little bit difficult than the information just um, unscientifically informed claims or facts that may be dif more difficult to be corrected. And I often use this communication model to try to guide my research on uh, how to understand the communication strategies for combating misinformation on social media. So this model is very classic in communication research, basically highlights all the dynamics people in communication are interested in. So basically we're interested in the process of how information uh, is sent or flow from the senders to the receivers and through media channels. And uh, a lot of communication research and studies are trying to look at the dynamics and the influences in the process. And this is only one way process, but nowadays we know that the receivers could also send feedback to those senders or other receivers that makes the communication multiple way. But here, I just feel like this is a really good way to categorize and frame uh, the studies on communication strategies for misinformation correction. So for in particular, on the senders end, there are studies looking at how different message sources could change people's misbeliefs and the behaviors. And one finding, one particular consistent finding is that when the information is coming from expert source or like doctors or from health organizations, that's going to be much more effective uh, than uh, information from the main media or like a lay person, like a regular social media friend. And on the message end, there are a lot of studies looking at what are the different message strategies, how the message is structured, and what are the message elements could enhance the effectiveness of misinformation correction. For example, there are studies looking at or comparing different tones. We know that sometimes the message correction could be very official, like from CDC message. Uh, it could provide data and facts about the benefits and side effects about vaccines. And on the other hand, there could be information that is less formal and people could use, for example, a humorous tone or informal tone to try to uh, make the message receivers feel a little bit closer. Uh, and so might be able to change their reactions to the persuasion attempt from the uh, misinformation correction. And that's another one. And also there are message strategies by um, correcting misinformation, either focus on the logic. For example, nowadays we see a lot of misinformation that is making causal claims out of correlation evidence or not even correlation evidence. Like for example, XYZ number of people died after getting the COVID-19 vaccines. But even though there is, a nozzle, uh, there is not enough evidence to show the causal link between deaths and uh, vaccines, but people love to spread that information. So we could correct that by pointing out the logic fallacies behind that, by showing that correlation doesn't mean causation or there's not even correlation evidence. Okay, so that's about message strategies. And then there are also on the media side, we also look at how the media channels with the features of media could influence the effectiveness of information correction. So for example, the information correction could be presented as audio, video, or images, whether that makes a difference. And there are also other social media features like fact checkers, and sometimes we see that uh, there's a li little flag or label saying that for more uh, credible information about vaccines, please check CDC's websites. So there are also studies looking at how the different media features and how information is distributed to the audiences can change their perceptions of misinformation. And also on the receivers end, there are a lot of studies looking at um, how the different individual differences, like the demographic features Dr. Liu just re uh, reviewed, presented, and also cultural differences may change how receivers react to different message correctives. Okay, so this is how basically I, the framework I use to categorize the strategies for misinformation correction. And so in particular, I want to talk about one of my recent studies on misinformation correction, uh, correction I conducted last year. 
and in particular it look at the message strategies and also different correction mechanisms on social media in particular this is conducted in the context of misinformation about um, e-cigarette use and e-cigarette use associated with lung injuries uh, even though it's not COVID-19 but I think overall the study findings could have implications uh, for correcting health-related misinformation and in particular in terms of message strategy I'm interested in the format in terms of story or narrative versus non-story the reason I'm interested in this because a lot of misinformation actually get, uh, go viral online because as Dr. Liu just um, reviewed, it's because it has a very large emotional impact. It tells a story. So it's probably uh, more persuasive or more effective in some way in changing people's attitude than a non-story messages like a CDC official messages with a lot of facts, statement and statistic because it tells a story. It tells like a story character suffered from severe outcomes of a health behavior. And in that way, because it can um, more likely to be emotional appealing and connected to the uh, to the message receivers. So people are more likely to be influenced by that kind of message. Then uh, that becomes a question is, since misinformation use stories to persuade people, why can't health professionals use the same story format to combat misinformation? So in this study, I particular looking at whether using a story to correct people's misbeliefs about e-cigarettes would be more effective than a non-story message. And in addition to that, I also look at the two different correction mechanisms on social media. So there are two different ways basically uh, decide how we encounter information on social media. And sometimes we read or uh, get exposed to a particular information because one of our social media friends forwarded that messages. So we see that showing up on our social media feeds and like people commented, wow, this is worth checking out. Please take a look at this message. And on the other hand, sometimes social media algorithm may also prompt some messages to us. So for example, it may give you some message like people also liked. So this gives you a little bit of social norm heuristic. And also another way of doing this from social media platform end is they may pr promote messages in terms of similar stories. So this may hint at that you have read some information on this and here are some similar stories related and you might be interested in this. So this is the information we encounter when the algorithm prompt the message to us. So in this study, I particularly look at how correction mechanism and also story format could together shape the effectiveness of misinformation correction. So basically I conducted two experiments on this. And the reason for two, two experiments is basically just to replicate and see if the findings are consistent. There's a little bit variation in to what extent the correction is endorsed by the source. So for example, if it's coming from social media friend, sometimes the social media friend may say that this is a story I completely agree. Please take a look at it. And I think nobody should use e-cigarettes anymore. And that would be considered as an explicit endorsement. On the other hand, sometimes our social media friend, they just forward a message without uh, saying or indicating a strong endorsement. They would just say, oh, this is something worth checking out. And also similarly, when the algorithm promote message to us, it says people also liked. It indicates that a lot of people are agreeing that with that message but if it's just, if it's just say um similar stories that may not carry that endorsement extent so i vary that a little just to see how that different levels of endorsement may also change the, uh, may also change the patterns and interestingly the findings i got from the two experiments are pretty consistent with each other um, and the procedure in the experiment is like this. So when participants get, got into the experiment, I just showed them a series of social media, Facebook posts. And, and in the mix of the social media posts, they got exposed to this misinformation, saying that e-cigarettes are 95% um, less harmful than typical cigarettes. And that's according to a public health report. And then after people got exposed to those social media messages, I then show people the message corrective. That is either 
recommended by the social media friends or by the social media algorithm, and that's either story versus non-story. And the fi findings are pretty consistent. So in general, from the charts, you could see that overall, when uh, the misinformation, when the correction is sent by our social media friends, that may be more likely to be effective compared to if the message is sent by algorithm. And the issue attitude is basically just asking what's your attitude towards inhibiting or reducing the use of e-cigarettes and behavior intention is just your intention to support that, to reduce the use of e-cigarettes. And then um, in addition to the social correction could be more effective than algorithm correction, the study also shows that the story format, the message format actually matters. So for social correction, if the message is from a social media friend, story appears to be less effective than not story, surprisingly. But then for algorithm correction, telling a story, if the message tells a story, it could be more effective than non-story. Okay. And the patterns are similar for the behavioral intention. It's just the effect size a little bit smaller, and that's typical when we move uh, the cognitive variables downstream to the behavioral variables. Okay. And so what is the reason for um, that, for that story format actually make a difference? Why story isn't always better than non-story? And so I also measured other variables to figure out the psychological mechanisms. And what I found is actually people consistently rate the story message as less credible than the non-story messages which a little bit inconsistent with prior evidence because prior evidence always saying that story um, is very advantageous than non-story in different ways, including emotional impact, including uh, engagement from the audience end, and in including their motivation to process the message. One reason for that is particularly, or perhaps because in prior research comparing story versus non-story, they only exposed people to one single message but my study actually includes uh, two messages. People are exposed to the misinformation first and then the story. And because the two are inconsistent, so people are not directly drawn to the message as they used to be with a single message, they would find the inconsistency and generated a more critical evaluation of the messages. And in that case, sometimes story, because the format is no uh, similar compared to what we typically read from a scientific information from like CDC report. It's less about statements, facts, and statistics. It's just stories. So sometimes people, so in that scenario, people are more likely to feel like, oh, this is just unscientific. This is anecdote. This is not facts. Or this is just um, not statistically significant. It does not appear. It's just small likelihood event or something like that. So people tend to criticize or more likely to criticize story when they have seen the misinformation first. But for some reason, the algorithm correction seems to provide a cure for that process and adding some credibility credentials to the story messages. So when people saying people also liked, so it basically means that a majority of others have agreed on this message. So it's kind of like a social norm heuristic or bandwagon heuristic. And on the other hand, if the algorithms are saying similar stories, typically people trust the machine and think it's unbiased, objective. And that machine heuristic may also provide a cure for the limited credibility evaluation, evaluation of story messages. Okay, and to um, explore whether my theories behind this reasoning actually work. I also conducted some mediation analysis. So basically this just is consistent with my earlier suggestion is, um, so the biggest to take away from this study is actually um, story messages could be more effective than non-story messages, but that has a limitation. Uh, story messages will be more effective in correcting misinformation only when some credibility credentials or heuristic are added as the message is delivered. So for example, the algorithm. But for social media correction, like from a social media friend, and in particular in the study, I just asked people to imagine that's from their social media friends versus like uh, saying that this is, think about a doctor friend. 
so people are less likely to feel the story coming from the social media friend is credible. But I think adding the credibility credentials like um, medical training, medical background, or medical degree would certainly help in bringing up the credibility uh, potentials from narratives. And then the other emotional impact of narratives could better promote the effect. Okay, so that concludes uh, my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And let me know if you have any questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Huang. Um, next, we are going to hear from Dr. Harlow. Um, and I just wanna make a note, um, since we kind of started a little bit late, we're kind of bumping up against uh, 7.30. So if you have questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, and it's likely that uh, a couple of us are not going to be able to go, but we are uh, going to share our presentation slides with you all if that's something that you can facilitate, um, Ariana, uh, distributing to the members. Okay, um, I am going to introduce now Dr. Summer Harlow. And Dr. Harlow is an associate professor of journalism in the Valenti School of Com. And she has a PhD in journalism and an MA in Latin American studies from the University of Texas at Austin. She is trilingual. She speaks English, Spanish, and Portuguese. And she researches the intersections of emerging media technologies, international communication and journalism, alternative media and activism with an emphasis on Latin America and marginalized groups. She is a former Inter-American Foundation Grassroots Development Fellow, and her dissertation won the Napsinger Y. Salwin Dissertation Award for the best dissertation in the field from the Association for Journalism or for Education in Journalism and Mass Comm. She's also the author of a book entitled Liberation Technology in El Salvador: Reappropriating Social Media Among Alternative Media Projects which was published in 2017 by Palgrave Macmillan. Macmillan, sorry. Her scholarly work has received numerous recognitions from uh, industry organizations and has been published in top tier or top peer reviewed journals such as Journal of Communication, New Media and Society and Journalism. And before coming to U of H, she was an associate or assistant professor of social media at Florida State University. A former newspaper reporter, Dr. Harlow stays connected to the field of journalism practice through freelancing and her work as a press freedom analyst for Freedom House. And I believe she has uh, another book either published by now or um, in the works, so she might want to plug it at some point. So, um, okay, take it away, Dr. Harlow. Okay, thanks. Um, and I am, I know we <laughs> are basically out of time, so I'm just going to kind of try and rush through this. Um, and Dr. Liu already talked about what misinformation is and how it's not just inventing something whole cloth, right? It can be um, quoting a fake expert or using emotional language or trying to discredit experts. Um, we also know that some people refer to it as counter media. Um, and this is, these are these sites, these websites that have been created to produce quote unquote news that is biased, hyper-partisan, misleading, and really omits um, the important information. So um, the, what we need to think about when we are looking at all this misinformation on social media is how do we even decide what's real and what isn't, right? So um, when we are thinking about deciding what is true, We've got a few different things that we can do, right? Obviously, we look at whether or not it's compatible with what we already know. Um, we should look at the credibility of the source, whether or not other people believe it, whether the information is internally consistent, right? So if you're reading through a story and you see that, you know, the first paragraph contradicts something later on, that's a pretty good sign that this is not um, verified, valuable, true information. And then is there any kind of supporting evidence that is presented in the study or in the story? Are there links that will take you to that outside reports that really will tell you whether or not this is true? Um, and we also have to keep in mind, as Dr. Lu talked about, that ideology really comes into play here. So 
when we evaluate news and information that we find on social media, if it aligns with our political views, we're less skeptical of it. Um, and so that in and of itself should be a sign for you, right? If you automatically assume that it's correct, just because it fits within your pre-existing belief system, well, maybe that's a sign that you need to take a second step back and think about whether or not it's actually accurate. Um, and we do know that, and Dr. Luke kind of mentioned this as well, that um, political party, political ideology plays into this. And in particular, um, extremism. And we see that it is people on both ends of the spectrum who are more susceptible to fake news or misinformation, um, but especially people on the far right, much more so than people on the far left. And social media itself create, all the different platforms create this environment where it's very easy to not, uh, or where it is easy to be susceptible to this misinformation. Part of this is because we are just scrolling rapidly through our feeds and we're not really paying attention to what that information is, right? We see the headline and that's it. We don't actually spend the time to deliberate and to evaluate and to review that information. We also know that information that is, um, or misinformation that is easy to read and hear, um, that is part of the reason why we become more susceptible to, to this misinformation because misinformation more so than accurate real information is easier to read and easier to hear because it's mostly put together by people who don't um, necessarily have the backgrounds and the evidence that might sometimes complicate stories and make them more difficult to read or to understand. People who have more of an intuitive, rational, or intuitive style of reasoning rather than an analytical, rational style also are more susceptible to misinformation. And then as Dr. Liu mentioned, um, lack of trust in media, but also lack of trust in other people contribute to that susceptibility. And then when we look at the platforms themselves, there's a few different factors that we need to, to think about that relate to this idea of susceptibility. Um, and interestingly, and uh, interestingly enough, Facebook is much worse than Twitter for sharing misinformation. Um, one study from 2020 done by some researchers at Princeton, Hop et al., they found that 71% of Facebook users versus 95% of Twitter users shared no counter media posts at all, which is great news. But when you flip those numbers, it's not so great news for Facebook, right? And that still does mean that 5% of Twitter users are still sharing misinformation. Um, again, it's those who self-identified as extremely conservative who accounted for the most misinformation that was shared on both platforms. And one fifth of users at those extremes, whether the left or the right, they were responsible for sharing half of all of the misinformation that was spread on both Facebook and Twitter. Again, age is a big part of this. Um, people who were 65 and older, as Dr. Lou mentioned, they're seven times more likely to share misinformation than those ages 18 to 29. Also important though is that people ages 18 to 49 are better at discerning fact from opinion than people aged 50 or older. Um, and why that is and what we do about that, that's what we need to figure out, right? Because if people who are 50 or older are reading social media and they think that they can um, recognize fact, they think that they can recognize opinion, but they can't, that's a problem because that's contributing to this spread of misinformation. And all of, a lot of people have talked about, oh, well, maybe we're in this post-truth era um, where, you know, people are unable to distinguish fact from fiction and they're willfully ignorant and they're willfully and purposely sharing misinformation and lies. But some recent studies tell us that that's actually not necessarily the truth. 80% um, of people surveyed in one study in particular said that they think it's important to only share accurate content online. Lots of studies also show that most people say they never share misinformation online. 
So what that means then is that it's less about our attitudes toward truth and more about our attention to truth. So we need to focus on that attention. How do we keep people's attention on, the, on these posts so that they take the time to recognize misinformation? Um, yet we do know that in experiments, despite people saying they only wanna share accurate information, we still know that 50% more false news is shared than accurate news. So then the question becomes why? Um, and we've got a few different ways of looking at this, right? We can blame the companies. Um, we can blame the users themselves, right? This, these are social media platforms. That means that we care about likes, comments, retweets. They give us validation and we, they make us feel good about ourselves. And so that desire for attention, unfortunately, can often outweigh our attention to, to truth or distract us from the truth. The algorithms themselves are part of this issue, right? Algorithms prioritize engagement. If it is those sensational, emotional stories that tend to be misinformation, that are those that are generating the likes, the shares, and the comments, and those are gonna be the ones that automatically show up more often in people's feeds to begin with, which is why part of the reason why we see that misinformation spreads faster and farther than the corrections, and that's a problem. Even when we correct misinformation online, it does not reach people in the same way that that original misinformation reached people. And so companies are starting to try and solve this, right? Um, they're nudging users to stop and think before they share. They're labeling posts with, um, do you want to learn more about COVID-19? Here's, you know, here's where you should go for some actual information. Um, and studies show that just that kind of a simple accuracy reminder actually leads to people sharing or uh, retweeting less sites like Breitbart and retweeting more sites like New York Times and CNN. And so those, um, those nudges can help. We also know that, um, we, that companies are starting to specify whether or not users themselves have posted misinformation. So they're um, tagging it as potentially misinformation. And then they're deplatforming people like we've seen with Trump. Um, and this actually popped up when I was creating this presentation. Um, speaking of nudging toward accuracy, right? All I typed was COVID-19 and this pops up that this is a way to nudge people to make sure that they keep that accurate information. And um, I'm just gonna actually skip this slide. So um, what do we do, right? There's been all kinds of checklists that have been created. Um, uh, acronyms, right? Sit, stop, investigate the source, find better coverage, trace claims, quotes, and media to the original content. Look at the provenance, the source, the date, the location. Ask the five W's to figure out where this information came from, who uploaded it, um, and where it was created. And then, of course, we can play detective when we look at the profiles of people. Is it a real person? Do they use their full name? Can we find other social media accounts related to this person? So we have to do a little bit of digging, a little bit of detective work in order to be able to verify information. We're not always going to be automatically able to look at a profile or look at a post and know that it is incorrect. So um, there's just a couple of tactics and tools that I always talk to people about. Um, the basic ones, the easy ones, is it a verified account? Does it have that little blue check mark next to it on Twitter? If it does, that's a pretty good sign that um, it's gonna be a verified user, but that doesn't mean that that user can't share misinformation. So, um, and sometimes we don't know who the person is, so ask questions. If it comes down to it, contact the person and ask where they got that information that they're sharing. Look for tweets from trusted media sources. Are they sharing that same information? If they are sharing that same information that users are sharing, then there's probably a good chance that it's real and accurate. And then look for experts with different perspectives. If you see that um, one scientist says X, but then you see that five or six other ones say Y, what's the difference, right? Which ones should we believe? You're gonna have to do that research yourself. Um, and then looking at images, there's a lot of um, 
fake images and videos going around, you can use a reverse image search using 10i or Google Images, and it will tell you the provenance of the, that image, which helps you to know is this real or not. Um, another fun thing that you can do is to compare an image with the, uh, the weather. Use Wolfram Alpha. Um, and for example, if somebody says, oh, there's a, um, an anti-mask protest going on, look at all these hundreds of thousands of people who are protesting and it's a bright and sunny day and it says that it's happening in Los Angeles. And then you look at the date and the city for that particular protest that's supposedly occurring and you see that, oh, well actually right now it's cold and rainy there then that means that that photo couldn't have been from that, from an anti-mask protest happening that day, right? It's from something else. And then maybe you do your research a little bit more and you find out, oh wait, that was actually a Black Lives Matter protest from a week ago. So there's tricks that you can do to try and figure out whether or not videos and images that you see shared are actually accurate. Um, and then of course, go to the fact checkers, see what PolitiFact or factcheck.org says. Um, do a Google search and change your terms. Do an advanced search to see what comes up. Because if something is fake, the more you Google it, the more it's going to become obvious that it is fake. So um, I'm just going to end it there and say thank you for your time and let me know if you have questions. All right. Thanks, Dr. Harlow. Um, so like I said, um, I think we're going to go ahead and just share our present, the final two presentations, um, with the group, uh, via, um, whatever listserv y'all probably have. And, um, hopefully you'll email us if you have questions. We're very open to hearing feedback and we would love to continue to partner with you all if you have specific questions about how to combat um, social media or misinformation on social media or if you have some kind of um, idea of what you want to do in your organization and you just need some kind of advice. Um, so that said, thank you so much for your time tonight, and we hope you enjoyed hearing about some of this cutting edge research, and good luck to all of you on the front line. We know that uh, your jobs are extraordinarily difficult right now, but um, we appreciate, you know, what you do, and thanks again for taking time to, to attend uh, uh, this presentation and to um, hopefully follow up with us. So thank you all um, to this wonderful team from the Valenti School of Communication at University of Houston. This has been so interesting, and I know there's so much more information that, that um, you have yet to share with us. We'll make sure to get those presentations out to all of the uh, our members. We'll also, we'd like to let you know that while we were screening this, on, we were also on Facebook Live. So we did take advantage of using social media to promote uh, uh, presentations about social media and misinformation. Um, so again, thank you to everyone that, that presented. Thank you to our participants. This will be recorded and available. Anybody who has questions, feel free to email me, feel free to email Jorge, comment on social media, um, at, at our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and we also have a YouTube channel. Um, Jorge will be sure to, to share all of that because I sadly don't know those things off the top of my head. Um, and again, thank you and have a wonderful evening. We'll follow up because this is such a, a big topic and a relevant topic. Uh, we'll hope to do a similar presentation later this summer, perhaps something a little bit more interactive where we can have some case examples um, and see what other people are interested in addressing in terms of their use of social media, both from a professional as well as personal perspective. So have a wonderful evening, everyone, and may the fourth be with you. <laughs>